Good morning. I'm Angela. Welcome to the schoolhouse. Time for another garden tour. It's the first week of July. Today we're going to the vegetable garden um, and we're going to exclude the other gardens so we don't go too long. But before we get there, I just wanted to show you how amazing the lavender is looking. Oh my gosh. The kids are still sleeping. Our guests, our b, &B guests are still sleeping. Laszlo and I have been out working on the farm, working on the fence, and uh, now it's time for me to get back into the garden. And just before I do that, I want to show you this beautiful fence that Laszlo and the kids finished last weekend. It's looking awesome. So now he's putting up the electrical portion on the outside and then we're donezo on the fenso projecto. Man, these projects take weeks. You think you're going to hammer something out in a weekend and just not how it works, right? So you have to be ready because you have to be ready to give it whatever it requires. If it requires several weekends of your life, that's what it requires. But hey, when you can build a $30,000 fence for six grand just by doing it all yourself, it's kind of worth it. So before we get into the veggie garden, raspberry patch not looking so bad. Lucky, lucky, got some raspberries coming. All right, they're looking good. I don't. We're gonna get a little bit of fruit from those this year, but we shouldn't rely on it. We really need them to stabilize. The mulberry bush, mulberry tree is doing really well. This is a white mulberry, and uh, everybody is free ranging this morning. Where are they? Where is everyone? Uh oh, hiding right there. This little guy hiding right there. Another little guy over there. They're all over the place. As long as they're not eating my stuff, I'm okay. Look at these two guys hanging out in the raspberry patch. What are you eating? I want to know. What are you eating? All right, we're going to go into the veggie garden. Voila. First week of July, everything explodes in July in my zone. I'm in zone four in Southern Ontario and uh, things are, we're in a bit of a drought season. It's been pretty hot, almost no rain. So things are exploding. If you water, things start to explode this time of year. So this garden here is the one that we ended up tilling in order to get it ready this year, which normally we would never do. So uh, we have no till beds at our place, but we could not prep this meadow to actually plant into fast enough with just the pigs and chickens this year because we didn't have this fence built till what, April? I think this fence was built in April and it, uh, you know, this winter we'll have the chickens and the pigs in there all year and then next year they will have it tilled and ready for us to plant into. But this year we had to actually till with a tractor. And when you do that, you pay for it. Uh, it doesn't come for nothing because um, this um, field is going to want to rehabilitate itself after you go destroying that you know layer of life that exists um, on top of um, on top of our soil on top of our ground. So the pioneer weeds, the grasses, they want to come back and like you know if everything else, the vegetables are growing in the garden, that stuff wants to come back as well. And so it's going to come back with a vengeance. So my approach this year is to take things really easy. Um, if you like your garden really clean and tidy and orderly, you're not going to like this. You're going to think this is wild and crazy. But truthfully, there's a fine balance to be had because the, the weeds are, the weeds, you know, like uh, the weeds are also serving as ground cover, as green mulch. Sometimes I pull them because sometimes I feel like they're interfering with the things I'm trying to grow. And I do notice a difference between things like squash or pumpkins that I'm growing in there versus squash or pumpkins that I'm trying to grow, you know, in the food forest where there's a lot more competition. So there is a difference. Um, however, I do subscribe to the idea that um, all of the life that we have in the garden is feeding the soil. So I try to leave as much of it as possible in the walkways um, and in the areas where the, the soil might be bare. I try to leave it there too. Okay, so let's get in here. Now the first thing I'm going to show you is these three mounds that were created when the tractor went through and I let them be and just grew into them. And for a long time it looked like we were burying bodies back here. I swear we're not. I'm just joking. <laughs> Sixth sense of humor. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is this mound here. And yeah, there is a lot of stuff in here that you might think doesn't belong. And sometimes I'll pull it, especially if it's coming up close to my little fennel babies. So we've got bronze fennel in here and we have bulb fennel. They're really small still, but some of them, some of them are larger and they're coming along and you can kind of see the little bulbets forming. 
And if this soil was a little bit, a little bit softer, they might be doing a little better. But they're coming along, they're getting there. Beets, beets are getting enormous. And beets can be multi-sown. You can put them in really close together and they will just like butt up against each other and make room, spread out. So uh, you can thin them out too if you want, but I found that you really don't need to. So you can get a lot of beets in a small space and they don't grow all season. So eventually these will come out and new things can go in. So yeah, you see there, there's a lot of grass and stuff that wants to come up this plantain. Um, you know, sometimes we feed it to the chickens because it's really good for them. So I don't spend time going crazy trying to clear this out and make the soil naked again just because it's pretty. Because, I mean, pretty is great, but let's be honest, we're trying to grow food here. So that's our number one priority. So break up your weeds that are hanging out around your plants and then lay them down around your plants like this, for example. So this little guy is trying to come up. What are you? Probably... I'm guessing a squash. You're probably a squash. So I'll go in here. You know, we've been through this in the last video, and if you're watching anybody else, they're probably doing it too because this makes a lot of sense. And then I just create like you know a little nest around this little guy, and he's happy, and it helps keep the moisture in, and um, as it decomposes, it feeds him too. So that's the basic principle of how how I manage. Um, you know how I use the weeds in the garden. The weeds are your friends. If you could wrap your head around that, I know it's not easy because things start to look pretty crazy uh, this time of year. Okay, so I've got a few extra tomatoes here that I took from Dad's because he had some overcrowding. I think they're supposed to be acid-free. Those like acid-free, yellowy tomatoes. Looking forward to seeing those. The beans. The beans, okay, so the beans, I think I over mulched early on over the beans that we had planted into the ground. And I think when you do that, the beans have a really hard time popping up. So we didn't have a great germination rate. So afterwards, I went in and replanted the beans two weeks later. This garden has been planted for a month. So everything in here has been here for a month. This is its fifth week. So I went in and replanted the beans, only these are supposed to be bush beans and I I think I may have accidentally put some pole beans mixed in with the bush beans, so we're going to have a really big mess here in a few weeks. Nonetheless, there will be lots of beans and that's kind of the point, but that's why I had to put up these bamboo stakes because I realized, hey, you're not a bush bean, you want to climb, they're sending out these runners and they want to go. So I had to put up some poles this morning. These bamboo poles were the same poles my grandfather used in his garden with his pole beans. So I feel like he was here this morning going, Angela, come on now, don't you know what you're doing? No, 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 I'm just figuring it out. Okay, what else have we got? Lots of swaths of um, basil. This is obviously really densely planted, but the point of it is to keep the critters away from my food because they don't like the smell of basil. And I'm like, that's easy. Because when you grow a big swath of basil like this, it seeds so much that you can dry it and collect it and just plant swaths of it the following year. Like basil till, you know, the cows come home. This is a Thai basil here. It's so easy to take seed from. You'll never have to buy it again. That's the point, right? Save your seed, never buy it again. And every time you, um, you know, you grow something in your own climate, in your own zone, um, you know, the, the seed gets stronger and the seed becomes more, what's the word? Not, not climatized, but it comes more, it gets stronger and then it can do much better and it'll grow better for you. So when I buy seed from a store and I plant it, dad's seed that he gives me usually does quite a bit better because he's been growing in this zone for years. So go figure. I think there's the thing, there's a thing going on there. I'm not sure what it is, but it's a thing. It's a thing. Okay. These are my ground cherries. I've never grown ground cherries before. They're looking so, so sad. Laszlo is being so noisy, it's so annoying to have a husband who's building a fence when we're trying to do a video. I'm joking. He's building a beautiful fence. I'm grateful for it. It's going to be gorgeous. And it's going to keep the animals out of my garden because last year they ate everything. Okay, back to the ground cherries. Ground cherries are more like a fruit than a vegetable. I think they are a fruit actually. And there are these tiny little 
I think they're in they're in the nightshade family. They're like a little tomato, tomatillo, but they're sweet apparently. I've never even eaten one, let alone grown them. But this year we had a lot of flea beetle damage and it really slowed down their growth. But now they seem to be rehabilitating, shooting out new leaves. And when a plant is healthy, the bugs tend to stay away from it. So they only attack it when it's young or when it's sick, when it's, uh, you know, when it's not doing well. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens to this guy. They come out like this, these tiny little, can you see him in there? There he is right there. But they're supposed to be covered with this lantern-like shell. And then this will dry, it will drop to the ground, and that's when you know it's ready. So these ones, I only have six of them here in the garden. They're not doing great. They all, they all suffered pretty extensive flea beetle damage. They are rehabilitating, but I decided to plant, um, to seed a few more closer to the house um, because I really want to see a nice crop of these and see what I can do with them in the fall. Also growing sweet potatoes out here. They're really growing slowly out here in the garden. They're doing much better closer to the house. Um, I have them growing in big giant buckets at the house and they're like big and green and vibrant and out here, although they probably have a more fertilized soil, um, they're probably having a hard time breaking through this silty clay. So, I mean, that's great. They're gonna help me bust up the soil. It'll be better next year, but I'd really like to get some sweet potatoes out here. There are several of these little plants. They're doing all right. They're doing okay, they're coming along. They've had lots of water now because they've been watered. So hopefully, you know, we're gonna have a scorcher again today and they'll put on some growth. Okay, let's go further into the garden. Tomatoes. So we strung up the tomatoes this year using these T-bars and then this wire that runs along to the next T-bar at the other end. And then, I used some old string that my grandmother left us and tied up the tomatoes like this. One tomato on this side, one tomato on that side. And as I come along, I will just wrap them up. Every day I come along and wrap them up a little bit further around the string. This one's not a good example because he's doing great. But maybe I can take you over here and show you. This one here, for example, take him, wrap him around the string again and he keeps going and keeps going. And that's how I stake my tomatoes. I, I feel like it gives the tomatoes a little bit of give. They get to blow in the wind, which is great because that means it keeps them um, aired out. You don't want your tomatoes to have no air because then they develop diseases. And a little trick that my dad taught me with tomatoes is to take off the lower leaves. Like for example, as they start to grow, you wanna help them focus on fruit production and you wanna keep their leaves off the ground. So this one here, for example, I'll come along and have a look at his lower leaves. Take some of those off. You don't want to rip that like that. You don't want to do that. That's scarring. It takes time for the plant to rehabilitate. So you might wanna do this with scissors, but you take off these lower ones, right? Keep these leaves off the ground. These ones are okay because it's been really dry here, but if it starts to get wet, tomatoes will show you that they're not happy. They can't deal with too much wetness. And so you wanna keep this lower area, you know, a few inches off the ground, nice and clear. Again, scarring like that is not a good thing. So use some scissors if you can't snap it off nice and clean. And then what you would do is take some more compost from another part of the garden I don't have any here, but see, this is what I'm dealing with. Ooh. Ugh. Yeah. You know, and you want to hill up the tomatoes a little bit like this. Hill them up a bit because that will not only keep the roots drier, but also tomatoes will grow roots in any place where they make contact with soil. And then tuck in more of this mulch or bedding, whatever you have. So we put our rabbit bedding directly into the garden because rabbit poop is magical. Um, we uh, love to use it because it's a cold compost, so you can put it, uh, it's a cold manure, you can put it straight onto your garden, it won't burn your plants. Whereas uh, sheep manure, cow, horse, pig, chicken, it all needs to be composted for several weeks before you can put it on your garden or it will burn your plants. So um, the rabbit manure this time of year is great because you just clean out their space and bring it out here. 
And then we also bring the shavings. So the manure, the shavings, all of it, it just ends up out here. It dissolves with the rain, with the watering, you know, and it goes straight up against the plants. So that's great. We just keep piling it on, piling it on, piling it on throughout the season. And that's how we keep the plants um, from drying out. But it's also a natural way of fertilizing them. Right? That's pretty much tomatoes. We've got tomatoes in several rows here. One, two, three. Cherry tomatoes and uh, Polish tomatoes, Borghese's for sun-dried tomatoes, um, beaver slicer, black creme, a few different ones. Romas, that's an obvious one, I have to have that. The tobacco is doing well, looking stunning, and the insects are loving it. And that's precisely the point for me anyway, is that come and eat this and don't eat this. Look how beautiful these cabbages are doing. They're doing beautifully. So far, I've had minimal pest problems with the brassica. You can identify if you have a pest problem on your brassica because the leaves, ah, perfect, let me show you. The leaves look like this. And then you find these wee little guys. Can you see him right there? You see that little green critter climbing up? He has to go, sorry buckaroo. So a white moth has gotten in here and has plant, you know, has laid eggs in inside the brassica and they hatch out those little cabbage worms that love to devour. They will, you know, they grow up in two days and they will absolutely devour a whole head of cabbage and you will get nothing from that plant. So you have to come out often. They hang out on the backs of leaves along the veins along the veins of the leaves. I don't see anything else here, but you have to come out regularly. There are a couple of things you can do. You can uh, sprinkle them with diatomaceous earth um, to keep them off, or you can spray regularly with uh, soapy water in a spray bottle and spray them, and that really helps. Honestly, I've had almost no problems. I think it also helps that I have things like marigolds growing throughout the garden. There is garlic interplanted everywhere with just about every brassica. Also this wormwood. They apparently don't like, what else have we planted in here? We've planted, oh right, this mint. They don't like mint. So I've made an attempt to plant things that I know they won't like to keep them away. Let's hope it works because um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of effort to keep on top of all your brassica and uh, you know, I want to eat it. I want to get to the point where we can eat it. Okay, this is pretty cool. This is uh, Callaloo and it's something in the artichoke family. I've never grown it before. I only have three of these plants, but I'm going to give them a try. They're supremely beautiful. They grow nice and big and then these big, beautiful um, flowers that apparently are edible. I'm going to have to figure that out for the first time this year. That's not the only new thing I have in the garden this year. I also have Okra. Okra growing in the garden. Oh my gosh, look! Look! It's a flower! Oh my gosh, okra flowers are so beautiful. I did not see that. And it looks like this okra over here is growing flowers too. Look! I first tried okra in India. Thought I'd give it a try so I bought a local seed that I thought might be adapted to our zone to our province to our area adapted that's the word that I was looking for not climatized it, it adapts and then here is another example of a little nest that I built for this little cucumber so I just come around rip up all this stuff that's shading him to maximize maximize the photosynthesis if you want to learn more about that, you need to go to Canadian Permaculture Legacy on YouTube. This is where I learned all of this stuff. About soil health. All right, so he's got a little nest and then we have them all up and down the fence line. You can't see them, but they can see the sun and they get water and that's what really matters. This guy's looking a little bit overshadowed by his neighbors. So that's when you have to come in here and really kind of give it a little clean up stomp it down a little bit if you want. I know some people are like that looks crazy. I know it looks crazy. It's not about what it looks like. It's about what's really going on and once you start learning a little bit about 
how to take care of your soil, you start to realize that a beautiful garden is great, but the real goal of a gardener is to grow food. And if you can't grow the food and you can't keep your soil healthy for next year when you want to grow your food again, you're not really helping yourself. You're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. So it's, um, this is an everyday exercise coming out here and doing that, but that's what's required, right? And you know, you really do get passionate about it when you see your babies growing and you see your family eating the food. It gets very exciting. Here are some cauliflower. I see some holes in the leaves, so I'm gonna have a look, right? See who's, who's been hanging out on this little patio here. Not allowed. Looks clear. And then they shoot up new leaves and the new leaves will have no holes and that's when you know that the plant is rehabilitating itself. So a little experiment here is this little broccoli sitting outside of the tented area and then a bunch of broccoli on the inside. So this guy I'm doing nothing with, but he's got some marigolds and he's got all those other things that we talked about around him, some garlic. And on the inside, I mean, these guys are just rocking. They're just booming. I know you can't see it in there, but this is just an old mosquito net that, uh, you know, would go over a bed, a uh, queen size bed. And we planted a bunch of uh, broccoli on this side and um, cabbages on that side. And that's to keep the moths from laying eggs on the, the brassica. That way we get nice big heads and we can ferment it for the winter and we'll have a nice, uh, a nice pantry full of delicious food that is great for our gut, great for our health. And we have, what are these called? Eggplants. Yes, Black Beauty eggplants. Early on, they had flea beetle damage too. They looked like this. But I sprinkled them with diatomaceous earth only twice, only twice in a row. So over the course of one week only. And then they were able to put on all this new growth without any interference from the flea beetles. And uh, now that they're healthy and strong, the flea beetles, flea beetles don't come knocking anymore. So it seems to be key to get your plant stable, um, stabilized and healthy. And once you start doing that, then I mean, plants just fly, man, and the pests don't bother them anymore. And when you transplant into a garden, it's very common to have these kinds of problems because when you transplant, that is a state of stress. The plants have to readjust their new location. Um, and uh, that's when they're usually going to be attacked by um, whatever pests are out there wanting to eat them. So if whatever you can direct sow, you probably should because uh, I find that when I direct sow, things do much, much better. Um, they have less, they have fewer problems, fewer problems. Okay, more rows of similar things. I didn't plant everything in large swaths because one of the goals is to distract the bugs that want to eat your stuff. So if you plant everything together in the same place, you're basically just saying like, here you go, here, here it all is, and they just jump from one plant to another. But when you mix things up, I think it's probably more difficult for them to, to smell and locate what they're looking for. So we have more uh, red cabbage. What else is over here? This is De Chico broccoli um, and, and regular broccoli as well. More of the um, tobacco and they're flowering beautifully, attracting beneficials and hopefully distracting our unwelcome friends. Lots of leeks and garlic planted throughout. Lots of, um, you can see those little orange flowers in the back. Those are the marigolds, they're doing their job. And then a bunch more tomatoes here. And if you saw the way that uh, I had strung up the tomatoes, one thing I like about, about this, I mean, I, I just kind of tried this out this year. I don't, didn't really learn this properly anywhere, but um, if you find that the string gets loose because the tomatoes start to grow upward, then, you know, I just took a twig and wrapped it, wrapped it around the metal, the metal wire. This is leftover wire from an electrical fence project we were doing. Wrap the stick around and tighten the string around the stick and it kind of lifts lifts the tomato back up off the ground because you don't want tomatoes sitting on the ground and they're doing quite well let's have a look these are our biggest babies who are you you're a beaver slicer beaver slicer tomatoes looking really terrific and on this side oh you're so good looking what are you 
What are you? This is so much harder left-handed. What are you? Hmm, I'll have to tell you in a second. Let's see. I had everything labeled at one time, but you're green tiger. Green tiger tomatoes. They look great. They're looking really nice. Right? So we want to keep everything off the ground off the ground here. It's a little bit messy here. Might want to clean this up later on today. Come back with some scissors and shorten some of these leaves and get them off the ground. Okay, so this is another example of when I might take some things away. I don't want any sort of I don't want anything kind of growing right up against the tomato. I don't mind if it's in the walkway, but not up against my tomatoes. And then try to keep the mulch up around the tomato. Keep the moisture in. Peppers are doing really well. Again, tons of basil here, hoping to keep keep the unwanteds away. Okay, so what have we got here? We have like cayenne peppers, red sweet potatoes red sweet peppers, roaster sweet peppers, Alma paprika, which is a yellow Hungarian that we pickle every year. That's a really nice one. And then down at the end, I've got a couple of, um, a couple of hot ones. Hot, that's from mama. Nobody here appreciates spicy food except me, so I'm running solo on the spicy train. But then along the fence line, I also planted a bunch of these guys. They're still small. These are cucumbers and uh, they'll start climbing up the fence so we'll utilize that as a as a vertical growing space. Here's my hot tamale. Jalapeno. Uh, five, uh, Chinese five color. They looked really good so let's see how they do. We have some white pumpkins. They're doing great. Here's an example of direct sowing. Right? Look how much better this guy's doing. They don't really love competition, let's be honest. When they have lots of space, lots of nutritious soil, potatoes are doing great. The potatoes just took all the bedding off of, uh, from the, the, the stall where the sheep were um, in the springtime and piled it up onto the potatoes to exclude the light. As you know, potatoes, right, they grow, they grow uh, in darkness, they need darkness. And uh, if your potatoes turn out green, that's not really good for you. You might make you sick. So you need your potatoes to be coming out nice and white or red, whatever color they're supposed to be. But in order to do that, you need to make sure you're excluding the light. So you need to keep on adding organic material to your potatoes as they grow up. Look at the beautiful flowers that they put out. Gorgeous. Right on, you guys are beautiful. Honestly, everything in the garden is beautiful. And as you watch it grow, you realize nature's amazing. It's amazing. The, the corn is doing really well too. We've interplanted beans inside the corn. So as the corn stalks, they got a head start, we planted them first. As they grow up, these pole beans, I think they're pole beans, I hope they're pole beans, will grow up the stalks and we'll get an extra crop of beans in the back area over here. Okay, I think this might be second last thing I'm going to show you is this, this bed of quinoa. Quinoa is a supremely beautiful thing to grow. It's a bit of a challenge to harvest because it grows in these plumes and then they have to be, you know, they have, you have to get the seeds out of the husks. So that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a job, but you know, quinoa is high in protein and it's a great grain to grow, it's super gorgeous. It practically grows by itself. It requires very little water because as it grows, it shades its own, you know, it becomes its own ground cover. Here's another little experiment, little cabbage outside of the tent. He's doing quite well. I have picked some worms off of him, but he's doing a-okay. Forming a little head in there. That should be really nice. And then I'm gonna show you one more thing before I let you go. We're not going to tool around the, uh, the food forest today because each garden needs its own time. They're big, there's a lot going on in them. But I'm going to take you over to this beautiful red maple that we got this year. It's a 10 year old red maple that was relocated from another site and it was going to get cut down. So Laszlo made arrangements to have it uh, planted here. How exciting, very exciting to get a 10 year old tree because I mean, let's be honest, 10 years is a long time. So. Um, I mean, what a treat for us. So here she is.
beautiful 10 year old red maple and um, they need a lot of water if they're going to get transplanted at this age at this time of year so one of the strategies i've used is to plant to plant all of these uh, zucchini at her base and the zucchini as they grow up will shade the base and help to keep the moisture in as we water but then you know we come in with the excuse to water the zucchini but then we leave the hose a little longer and we water the tree as well so that she can stabilize this year so you know it's a method of interplanting things such as such that the needs of one also serve the needs of another and that's you know that's kind of what permaculture is all about right establishing systems that are um, sustainable and that are integrated all right so i hope you enjoyed that garden tour that's it for today i've got to get back to work before the kids wake up and want something you know mama always on duty all right so uh, I'll check you guys later. Have a great Saturday.